sleep. To, uh, oh, that is just fine. So I want you to look at these two pictures for a moment, digest them, and then I want to know what you see. Obvious answers are wrong. What do you I see listening. Listening. Where do you see listening? I see it in um, the patient in the yellow, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and I see it in the patient in the blue. Perfect. And you're using another word here, patient, right? So uh, these are patients. How do we how do we know that they are patients? One has a one who's a patient, and the other has a patient. Good, good. So some commonalities, right, in terms of medical equipment, um, life, uh, life preserving um, equipment for both of these individuals. Absolutely. Good. What else do we see? There are two photographs here. Mm -hmm. um, you said there's nothing that's too simple, right? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Obvious answers, welcome. Okay. And recognizing in these photographs, mm -hmm. um, the upper left mm -hmm. um, appears to have two. Individuals. Um, the individual listening was the what I seem to see as a little girl, um, and a figure beside her was some kind of um, some kind of cool graphic something um, standing up, little girl and a man standing, and that is set in a home environment. Mm -hmm. and. Um, so I'll just end with that with the two lots of simple things that you see. Terrific. Absolutely. All those are, are fabulous observations. Thank you for sharing those. Uh, what else do we see? What do we see in the uh, the bottom right picture? What strikes you? Again, uh, no wrong answers. What strikes me is the setting. Mm -hmm. uh, I see a lot of the equipment, the bed that you can find in the hospital. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I see four individuals in the photograph. Mm -hmm. One of them wearing a white coat, presumably one uh, provider or physician of some kind. Um, and also two other individuals. The uh, relation is unclear to the person who's in the bed. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I also see I, something in the hand which looks like a paper with uh, maybe a writing utensil. So uh, to the theme of this talk, maybe a communication in some way. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, so there are many differences in terms of the tone of these pictures, right? The setting, y'all mentioned as a difference, um, a home versus a hospital. And yet we have the similarities of the, the uh, medical equipment as well. We notice uh, differences between the ages of the patients, right? Um, what other differences do you observe between these pictures? Well, the color. The color. How so? <laughs> yes, absolutely. Kind of a sterile, dark, not a lot of natural light in this particular setting. And here we have, you know, uh, appears to be an open window nearby. It's a very uh, bright, colorful, warm, inviting atmosphere. Absolutely. What other differences do you see? To me, the kind of that left upper one feels like perhaps a little more lighthearted. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. you know, they might be a smile. Both of them, they, their outer edges of their mouths are. Absolutely. The, whereas the lower one, although they're all, in both, they're intent on an object that they're yes. looking at together in some ways it feels perhaps a little more serious in the bottom line, although not necessary. Trish, that's, that's such an excellent point regarding nonverbal communication as an indicator of environment, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, in order to be appropriate in a context, taking into account not just things that are said, a warm expression, a soft kind of smile um, indicating that this is a, a pleasant moment in many ways. And here we indicate a furrowed brow, right? Um, kind of uh, looking down this person. It's, it's difficult to see with the, with the lighting, but, you know, concern perhaps in a, in a great deal of pain, right? 
So I show you these because I think the composition similarities uh, and the differences are very striking between these two pictures, right? Um, these are both pictures taken in the context of end of life care. Um, the one thing we, uh, we did not mention is, is this a typical garb that you would wear in a hospital setting? A bell dress? Certainly not, right? Children, maybe. Maybe. Could be. Yeah, could be. Could be. Much children's hospital. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, which is nice because maybe that's kind of uh, taking some of what's nice about this particular uh, this particular image, right? The indication of how do we how do we uh, tailor the care to this individual and what and what they enjoy, what will make them feel comfortable. Um, so these are indeed two stories of and of. in the hospital and uh, at one point she said mommy I don't want to go back to the hospital that there it was a very interesting case uh, regarding autonomy of this child to, to make that decision um, but I think that the nonverbals are very key here right and this brings me into uh, an idea that is thrown around that may seem paradoxical uh, to some I'm sure not so much in, in, the, in this room but that is the concept of okay the good death. So the good death. What does that mean to you? What if, how do we how do we conceptualize a good death? And it, and it may be worthwhile to think of it in terms of what is not a good death. Sometimes it's easier to reach those clear conceptualizations by thinking what something is not. So when I say the good death, what does that mean to you? Not painful. Not painful. Very good. Very good. What else? Not in a hospital. Not in a hospital, absolutely, absolutely. In, in um, an environment of the person's choosing, perhaps, absolutely. What else? Well-timed. Well-timed, absolutely. Having time to prepare and anticipate and have control to the extent possible. Very good. What else? You need to mention control, I'd say on my terms. On my terms, absolutely. Nick, I wanna unpack that a little bit. What do you mean by on my terms? So, you know, you, you had mentioned uh, control where possible. There are some states that allow for medical aid and dying, some do not. And there are also some instances where, you know, where, when you become more debilitated and more confused that your wishes at one point might not, or what you're saying may not reflect what your values were given the time. So I wonder if I'm saying like on my terms, is it, my terms how I'm currently expressing them or my terms how I previously expressed them when I had those strong feelings. So absolutely. Um, who do you listen to? Mm -hmm. Past me or current me? Very good. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Um, do my values reflect my values when I wrote? If I or if I if I had these commun uh, these uh, communications in the past with people, do I still feel that way? Uh, do I accidentally still have my uh, ex-partner as my healthcare proxy from 20 years ago, right? Like, oh, should have updated that. Absolutely. Absolutely. They still might know you best. That's true. That's true. That's true. They may, you, if, they, if they had those, and if you had those insightful conversations with them, that is very true. I also think before you go on, I think um, for me, it's important to recognize the relational aspect, aspect mm -hmm. of it. And so uh, good for others too. Great point. Great point. Absolutely. Um, death that leaves our loved ones with memories that they can cherish rather than that traumatize them. Right. Um, that is a, that is a huge piece of the puzzle. Thank you for mentioning that. Absolutely. Um, there were a, a cool study that I, I enjoyed uh, interviews with palliative care physicians, patients, caregivers, nurses. Uh, what they were asked, what is a good death? And they came up with several common themes. So a life well lived, right? So helping someone understand that their, their life was, was worthwhile and giving them an opportunity to reflect on the things that they've done that have brought them joy, that have brought them pleasure, that have brought them ensuring, you know, the ability to incorporate that uh, to the extent possible. Preparation, agency, and control is a huge part of it as well, again, to the extent possible. <laughs> um, community. Right, being surrounded by the people that 
you, that care about you, that you have cared about. Um, dying in a preferred location, potentially at home. Obviously, that's a very a very common request in these contexts. Say, I, I don't want to die hooked up to a bunch of machines in a scary ICU. I'd rather I'd rather be home in a in a comfortable place that I that I know and love. Well managed symptoms, pain free, certainly a very important element too. And the least possible negative effect on loved ones. So there's a podcast uh, that I, I really enjoy, and it's referred to as the least worst death. Uh, rather than the good death, maybe what we would strive for is the least worst death. So in some ways, that may be easier for some folks to, to digest. Maybe it seems a little bit less paradoxical, phrasing like that. So how do we help patients attain good deaths? What do you think? By asking them how they find the death. Very good. Very good. Um, appropriateness and effectiveness in there. Right, we uh, are adapting to the needs of the patient. That's the appropriateness and effectiveness to help them achieve their goals. Our goal is to help them achieve their goals. Appropriate and effective, right there. Very good. How else can we help them to achieve uh, to attain good deaths? Thank you. Well, I like to think of advanced care planning as three very integral related processes. Right. So first step. Clarify healthcare wishes, right? How can you communicate to your loved ones if you've not thought about it yourself? What would I want in this situation? What is most meaningful to me? Perhaps um, cultural elements, you know, as we just we just learned from that great talk, um, you know, understanding the extent to which culture influences our attitudes towards what does a good death look like. So having those self-reflective, mindful engagements. Uh, intrapersonal communication is, is uh, what we call, we call in our field, right? Intrapersonal communication. Then we engage in interpersonal communication where we communicate those wishes to those that have a stake in the matter, right? Usually our loved ones, the people who may be asked to make decisions for us if we are unable to make decisions for ourselves. Communicating those with our healthcare providers, the spiritual care providers, um, Potentially legal assistance, you know, uh, is, is, a, is a beneficial thing to, to communicate as well. And then formalizing those wishes, right? It's, you need to do all, all of these three things in a perfect world, right? Um, but these two steps are absolutely critical to give the gift of clarity at the end of life to the people that you love. Because they're, they're going to be the ones, you know, called upon to make those decisions. Uh, on the worst day of their life, you can make it a little bit more manageable for them. And after you're gone, they won't be questioning, don't be guessing, second guessing, did we do the right thing, right? And this is what this is my primary area of research is, and particularly with uh, college students and young people, people who think they're healthy and immortal, right? Uh, how do we actually... Uh, show you that this is a relevant thing for you to be thinking about and discussing as well. Um, so I, I did a study in which I did a, a quantitative content analysis of advanced care planning patient education materials, okay. um, gathered pamphlets from hospitals around the country, uh, and kind of just examined on a high level what uh, do they say in terms of what are the benefits of advanced care planning, what are the barriers to advanced care planning, and also what steps do they take to increase perceived self-efficacy for patients, which is uh, uh, basically conceptualized as the extent to which patients believe they can effectively do something, right? Um, so basically uh, barriers that I identified uh, in, this, in this literature is that can be a difficult emotional, most certainly. Uh, it's very complex. It can be a very complex thing to understand. Um, disagreement, intra-family uh, conflict. Um, some people believe you need a lawyer in order to do it. And they perceive that as a, perhaps a socioeconomic barrier, right? Uh, often uh, they feel unprepared to have these conversations. They don't know who to choose. Um, initiating conversations can be a significant barrier, not just having them, how do you actually start these conversations? Sometimes that's just the most difficult part for people. Um, some people are, you know, it's just not a priority. I'm too busy. You know, I'm, if I'm, I'm not, to, I'll, I'll do it. I'll do it when I have more time. Um, I don't have to do it because a higher power will take care of everything. You know, it's another barrier. Um, patients, uh, there's a superstition element to it, right? Patients believe if you talk about death, you will invite it into the road. Um, and uh, also 
and it's not for it's not for everyone. So there, there are a lot of different barriers uh, that these documents talk about in terms of patient experiences, why they have a hard time engaging in advanced care planning. Um, and these topics are indeed very difficult to discuss. There's a stigma to talking about death. You know, I'm, I'm a part of the death positive movement. Um, it's uh, derived from the sex positive movement, right? Which is basically trying to uh, open up communication in order to bring these things into the light in order to help people, right? Uh, the more that we try to hide death under a bush, uh, the fewer people engage in comfort care measures, the, the more they are exploited by the funeral industry, right? Um, so it is a, um, it's a, it's a, it's a really worthwhile thing to bring into the light in order to protect people. Um, superstition, as mentioned. Um, medical culture is also not conducive to changing goals from curative to palliative in many ways, right? It's a, uh, from the very beginning of medical education, it's you know how do we how do we how do we get them better? How do we cure them? How do we heal them? Right? Um, and then at a certain point, it just can't, right? At least not in in such binary terms, right? It's not oh they're well or they're they're uh, they're sick anymore. It changes to how do we help them live meaningfully, change more the quality of life which is a really challenging thing to overcome where you're fighting against this norm that's been instilled in you from the beginning of your education. That's extremely challenging. Denial, uh, death denial. I'm not gonna uh, go too much into this, uh, this theory. It's called terror management theory. Uh, essentially, basically, uh, everything that we do as human beings to create meaning, so to bolster our own culture, to bolster our own self-esteem, is to deny that truth that it's coming for us all, right? It's a scary thing. So death denial promotes a lot of really um, harmful behaviors. Um, lack of literacy, right? This is, uh, and, and uh, I, I don't wanna put this on the patient. This is systems uh, that promote a lack of literacy, right? Um, additionally, earned distrust of the medical system. Uh, from people from different cultures, right? Um, like, I don't want to fill out this document. I don't know what you're going to do with it, right? Um, under again, earned distrust being the uh, being the name of the game there. Um, so, considering uh, the patient cases that that y'all have uh, been familiar with or have engaged with in the past, what do you perceive are the biggest challenges to your patients engaging in advanced care planning or completing advanced directives in your experiences? Probably a <laughs> <laughs> Sure, sure. I'm just trying to talk to you about our citizens. Mm -hmm. okay. well, why don't we uh why don't we pick one? And let's let's do, let's devise a communication strategy to address that specific barrier, right? So again, getting back to the effective and appropriate, appropriate for the context, effective in achieving our goals. These are barriers to achieving our goals. So how can we be effective? In motivating patients, uh, let's say denial. Let's go with denial. That's a good one. Let's go with denial. So let's think of a few specific communication strategies we could engage in to be more effective in motivating patients who would just prefer to deny the fact that <laughs> they're mortal. What do we think? We first have to ask them mm -hmm. to engage in conversation. Mm -hmm. And what if they say, yeah, I don't really have to talk about that. I'm fine. What could we do then? Knowledge that we've heard. Good. Um, and we suggest that we might need to plan in case something happens. Mm -hmm. Great. So validating their belief that, okay, perhaps this isn't the most or anything, but what if we have it? just in case. What's the harm just in case, potentially? Absolutely, absolutely. What are the strategies to be employed for a patient who has a pretty severe case of death denial? So uh, I had a, a colleague uh, one of my former institution who would recount a story about a, a very specific issue when he was working as an ethics consultant and he was also a palliative care physician. So he, he had a lot of these skills already. And there was one patient that he would talk about in saying that this patient would turn away 
and uh, you know just not engage in when it came to discussions regarding pretty much anything and so he would sit beside him and he would say i know you don't want to talk to me but i have something very important to talk to you about and it would be more and and, and he would ask may i share my may i share this with you to which the patient wouldn't say yes or no but instead of turning away he would turn to him as if he were now engaged in some way so you could definitely ask permission to be the speaker and not have a dialogue. Excellent. So by asking permission, by honoring that patient's agency and sense of autonomy in it, it may seem more approachable, at least less, uh, less adversarial. Maybe in some way. Absolutely. Great points. Thank you very much. Thank you. Excellent. So let's go ahead and, uh, oh, I got to take a thought. There we go. So uh, in general, I found kind of a lack of uh, messages to increase self-efficacy in the patient education materials, which is kind of messed up. That's kind of the point of patient education materials. Uh, but there were a couple of a uh, couple of things that I noted that I, some of them were more prominent. So they can ask providers, for, right? I don't know how to do this. Can you explain what this means? Right? Uh, they can ask for information to use other resources. They can ask their loved ones to help. To make things less scary, let them know that you can change your mind. Like we can, what you say here, you're not, you don't need to be held to it, right? Um, I think that can be a challenge to starting the conversation, right? Is where like, I don't want to make those decisions because what if I'm wrong, right? You know, you can, you can undo it, right? Um, you can use someone else's story as a way to get in this. There was a, a really great um, document that I read uh, called Mrs. Lee's story. And it was a patient education material in uh, in the style of a narrative, uh, and was very cool because it was uh, and it was specifically for um, Chinese immigrants. And basically, um, it was a story of this decision making process. And then they would they would tell a bit of the story, and then they would break down why this is relevant. Right? And it was a very it was a very clever structure. I, I thought that was an excellent idea. Is to Use someone else's story. Use that as a model. So it's not, I don't really even know where to begin. It's like, well, why don't we use this starting? It may not be that everything in this story fits perfectly for you, but it'll at least give you a place to start the conversation. So I thought that was really great. And uh, I would like far more to use it because very few actually use that advice. Um, encouragement, just very simple encouragement and, and praise, you know, like this is a really great thing that you're doing uh, for your family, you know, for yourself. This is great, you know, um, and uh, there are a lot of, uh, I'll, I'll send you the article if you want to read uh, all the details on that, but. I think it's important also to, to think it doesn't have to be a once and done thing. Yes. That, that it can be a start, you know, yes. like there's, it might be a process of needing to build some trust or ask the questions and see where it can go and really? maybe stymie for quite a while. Yeah. And it's just persistency, consistency. Absolutely. We don't have to strap in for a five hour, super dark conversation. We can, we can like, Hey, as we're driving home to the grocery store, what do you think about this for 10 minutes? And then maybe, you know, so you're like, Hey, remember that conversation we started? I kind of want to talk a little bit more about that. Breaking it into a, a more manageable piece is a great, great advice. Absolutely. So I'm going to give you a crash course in two communication theories. I promise we're not going to get too, too theoretical here. Uh, these are meant to be as practical as possible for healthcare providers, okay? So the first is known as goals, plans, action theory, okay? Uh, and basically goals are what we want out of a communication interaction, going back to the effectiveness part of communication competence, right? Plans are how we devise a strategy to achieve those goals. And then the action is specific measures taken to implement those plans. So it's a three-step process, goals, plans, action. And the main idea of this theory is that people have both a primary goal, which is the reason for going into the encounter, the main thing you want to achieve out, but you also have secondary goals with every communication encounter. You want something else out of it, right, besides the primary goal. Uh, so what? Why should healthcare providers care about goals, plans, and action theory? Well, you can use this logical three-step sequence to think through what you want to achieve out of any given interaction. You can think through beforehand, what is my primary goal here? And what else do I want to achieve? And how can I devise a strategy to achieve those goals 
uh, as effectively as possible. You can also use it to help your patients more mindfully understand what do they want out of a given interaction. And the, to the extent that your goals align, now you're cooking with gas, that's great, right? Um, you can, you can uh, name those similarities and those common goals and work together to implement plans uh, via actions that benefit both of you, right? Uh, also, if you are failing to achieve your goals, if you are failing to be effective, revise your plans. Right. Think about: Are these plans really achieving? Uh, are they are they allowing me to achieve these goals, um, or are the specific actions that I'm implementing are they consistent with what the plans logically would say would work in this given scenario? So, two worthwhile uh, uses for goals, plans, action theory in a clinical context. So, let's practice here. So, let's imagine our primary goal is to inform a patient that they've been diagnosed with stage four cancer. That's our primary goal. That's the reason we're going into the encounter. That's why we are here. That is our primary job right now. So what are some secondary goals? I'll start you off with one, maybe to comfort the patient, maybe a secondary goal that you would have in that encounter. What other sort of secondary goals might you have when that is your primary goal? Answering questions. Very good. Very good. Excellent. Answer any questions that they may have. Also uh, relate to that, encourage them to ask questions, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. What else? What other secondary goals might we have? Give them the news you're about to deliver. Maybe they help them identify goals they may have and plans they want to. Nice. Excellent. Absolutely. So um, helping them to understand what next and most importantly what do they want next uh given the given the realities maybe of what what may be coming good what else what other secondary goals might we have in this scenario well, it may not be in this conversation that's what they would have just said earlier about timing mm -hmm. um but given this information uh helping the patient understand what options the patient has been through very good very good. Um, understanding options and alternatives to those options. Um, also, understanding they don't have to do don't have to do anything. They don't want to, right? Absolutely, absolutely. So let's think about plans to achieve as many of those goals as possible, right? And plans they're they're a little bit more abstract, and goals and uh, action are a little bit more specific, right? So maybe our plan is to ensure a comfortable environment. I want to make the environment as comfortable as possible, okay? What other plans might we put into place in order to achieve as many of these goals as possible? Good, good, absolutely. So not only to have uh, create a comfortable environment, I wanna make sure that a uh, support system is present. Very good, what else? Patient, you know, may have preferences for how you deliver the information. They may want visuals. They may want, you know, um, uh, to use, you know, medical jargon or not use medical jargon. Sure. So your plan could be discussing how the information gets delivered. Good, good. So uh, considering the language that I use in order to ensure that as many of the goals are satisfied as possible. Good. So let's move on to action. So the goal may be to, first, the primary goal is to inform the patient they've been diagnosed. Secondary goal, comfort the patient. Plans to ensure a comfortable environment. The action, preserving a private room to have the conversation, right? So that's where it goes from kind of abstract into the specific, right? So what other specific actions could we take to achieve our, uh, our primary and secondary goals consistent with the plans that we have put in place? Well, it's interesting. Um, I'm thinking about the goal that plan that I had earlier, which is to sure the patient had people in the room and wanted to be to support that plan. An action to support that plan would be to give the patient notice and the opportunity to invite other people. Right. I'm also recognizing that that is signaling something that's the first to be ever done. Right. So I really wanted to be the first to be ever done. Great point, great point. And, and that's that's a really excellent example of uh, appropriateness there, right? Adapting to that specific context. They may draw meaning from the facts like, uh-oh, 
there must be a really bad conversation. Tell me, just tell me now. Just tell me now. I can't. I can't wait. I know something bad's coming. Right. Uh, so that's an excellent nuance point. Sure. Sure. What other actions could we take to achieve as many of these goals as possible? There's certain folks who really um, engage the patient in treatment, but not loud because presumably may not be the case, but there's a relationship that's already yes. So it's a great example of specific action. My action, instead of telling them this, it's going to be to ask them what they know, right? Excellent, excellent example of action. Make sure you stay at the time of your calendar. Yes. Yeah. Block out more than 15 minutes. Right. So you can take that time. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. So this is just obviously one example. We could plug in any number of challenges that, that we encounter, uh, that y'all encounter as, as uh, healthcare providers, people who work to support healthcare providers. Um, but it's worthwhile to always consider, what is my primary goal out here? What do I want most to achieve here? But what else do I want? Sometimes those goals are gonna be copacetic with one another, and sometimes they're gonna be uh, very contrary to one another. I mean, we could argue that this is a great example of contrary, right? It is not comforting at all to learn this information. So it's sort of a paradox. How do we how do we achieve both of these goals? So I, I would I would say, and, and one of the things that you had just mentioned is that you know the, the comfort and peace to it. You know, some patients be like, you know, I knew something was wrong with me. Thank you for clarifying that this is what's wrong with me. As as challenging as this news may be to them, uh, stage four cancer is no joke. But it may validate that they knew something was wrong with their body. Yes. They just didn't have a diagnosis or they didn't have a word to, or something to go along with it. And the, the news itself may be comforting. Yes. Sometimes the uncertainty is the most painful right. part. Now Absolutely. that they have something certain, something that they can latch on to, they can further cope with whatever they're dealing with. So I think that there's, there's certain value in Again, understanding your patient, if this is happening in the outpatient setting and this is a longstanding provider, that's one thing. If it's in the hospital yeah. and you've only had a short amount of time, I feel that there's a there there are some there are some nuances to to the conversation. Yeah. And again, you're talking about appropriateness or adapting to the context, which is which is terrific. Absolutely. Um, and again, I think uh, to Nick's point, I think uh, the action of Asking questions is an excellent action uh, because that may be their response. You know, you, you, that's why I say there's no script. You can't plan communication competence. You have to be flexible, right? You have to uh, adapt often in the moment to what the context gives you that's different from what you were expecting, right? Excellent. So I want to talk about social support. This has been my primary area for a couple of years now, is uh, understanding different types of social support. Now, when I say social support, what does that mean to you, social support? Presentation, people, money. Okay, great. Yeah, so um, uh, tangible support, instrumental support, potentially helping someone with, with finances, running errands, absolutely. Good, good. What else? What does social support mean to you? Insurance, sure. Absolutely. Absolutely. Thing that supports social well-being. So that could be human connection. Mm -hmm. That could be not human connection, depending yeah. on who you are. Sure. Um, uh, so I think social support is, is self-defined mm -hmm. as to what would support your social health and your social well-being. Great. That's actually, you're like an audience plant because that's what this theory is all about, which is terrific. <laughs> uh, but so uh, there are different categories of social support that fit in uh, with uh, quite a bit of what, what was just discussed there. So I'm going to teach you briefly about each of the categories and then share with you my very favorite theory, which is called optimal matching theory. So uh, informational support is a type of social support, providing information to somebody. Um, just as, as uh, Nick was saying there, Decreasing someone's uncertainty can be a source of great relief, right? So information, informational support is a really key form of social support. 
also instrumental and material support, running errands for somebody, helping someone financially, right? Um, getting someone a tissue box, right? These are uh, these are kinds of instrumental and material social support. There's also esteem support, which is helping someone feel uh, validated, right, in their in their person and things that matter to them. Right? Also, network support, which is helping someone feel that others care about them, right? That they are part of a network of people that uh, that want. Uh, that want their well-being, right? and then um, emotionals. I think is what most. I think most people kind of mix up the words social support and emotional support. I think um, most people think like, oh, it's just emotional support, but social support is a much larger umbrella. But emotional support is obviously a huge portion of it as well. So I'm going to break down a few specific um, specifics with each of these support types, and we're going to talk about in the context of death, dying, and serious illness what types of support are most beneficial in different kinds of contexts, okay? So <laughs> informational support, right? Providing useful information, teaching relevant skills are uh, kind of two key parts. So not just sharing information, but also teaching someone how to do something. And we talked about, hey, here's how you fill out an advanced directory, right? I can show you how to do that, right? It goes beyond just it's like, hey, you should go to this website. It's, no, no, I'm going to teach you how to do it, right? So these are uh, two really valuable forms of informational support. Uh, instrumental support, providing tangible resources, completing tax, uh, tasks for them, access to finances and things like that. That one's pretty simple. Then esteem support. So uh, compliments, complimenting somebody like, hey, that's really amazing that you did that or, or think that or feel that, or I think you're, you know, I think you're so strong. You know, these, are, these are great examples of uh, compliments. Validation of what they're feeling, frustration of it, um, how much pain and effort that, that, they're, that they're going through. Just validating that is, is, a, is an excellent form of social support. Relief of blame. You know, in these contexts, they're existential, right? Uh, they are very deep questions that get at the core of what it is to exist and, oh, what did I do wrong to deserve this? Right. Um, I'm sorry. Say again, Trish. Yeah. Why me? Absolutely. Absolutely. So providing that relief of blame is a really key form of esteem support. And finally, we'll get into uh, uh, emotional support here. So emphasizing the relationship. Right. You know, um, I care about you. You're my brother, and I love you. You know what? Whatever it may be. Right. Like I've been your provider for so long, and I have. I've, helped you and your family and I, I'm, I'm here with you, you know, emphasizing your relationship to the person is really key for So sympathy and empathy, I think are important to discuss together. How do y'all understand the difference between sympathy and empathy? It's going to be kind of tricky to tease those things apart. Well, I think the sympathy is feeling forward is for the best. Nailed it. That's like almost verbatim. <laughs> That's, maybe I read that one for you. <laughs> uh, absolutely. Absolutely. Right. So um, sympathy is I feel sorry for you that you're going through this. I'm so sorry that you are going through this. Empathy is I'm here with you. I'm suffering with you. Compassion. Suffer with. Right. Um, there are a lot of different kind of dimensions. F is a, a multi-dimensional construct, right? So um, emotional contagion is often a big part of it. Um, there's also cognitive empathy. So be perspective taking, understanding. Um, here's, here's how I think you're thinking. Here's what I think you're thinking. Here's how I think you're feeling. And I may be feeling along with you, right? So sympathy versus sympathy, very good. Um, encouragement, you know, this is hard. Hang in there, you know. Sometimes those messages may be more helpful in certain contexts, and some, some less. But it is a valuable form of social support to have in your arsenal, I suppose. And then just listening and presence, just being there, just listening, asking the questions, and hearing, really hearing the answers. Um, not feeling you have to fix everything, but instead just being there uh, is, for my money maybe the most important form of social support in these contexts is just, just being there so the person knows that they're not being abandoned and it's really 
this challenging time, right? Sharing these beautiful, potentially beautiful experience, potentially hard experiences, but just being there together the whole time. Oh, there's no more network support. Helping someone feel that others care about them, right? Hey, this person's in the hospital. Let's get all of our coworkers together and, and all sign a card for them, right? You know, just a, a simple, simple act like that. Or this patient is going through something that the best I can do is provide sympathy because I've never gone through this. Hey, there's a support group in the hospital who can, who can help with this. Let's connect them into that network so they have people who uh, have experienced something similar that they can really get some valuable uh, information and that network support group. So, so are all social support types created equally? The answer is it depends on the context, right? Going back to the uh, going back to the appropriate and effectiveness, right? It depends on the context. So this is one of my very favorite theories, optimal matching theory. It says that social support types must be matched to the context in order to facilitate coping. And there are two different kinds of coping. There's problem-focused coping and emotion-focused coping. So problem-focused coping helps people to deal with the actual stressor at hand. Uh, to make the stressor go away or, or to, min to, to minimize it to the extent possible. Emotion-focused coping helps people deal with the emotions brought on by the stressor. Okay? Um, stressor context, according to optimal matching theory, vary in the following ways. So stressors can be desirable or undesirable. So parents of children and or pets, that's a desirable stressor, right? It's certainly a stressor. It certainly makes life uh, more stressful, but we want that, right? Uh, the, the juice is worth the squeeze, I suppose, right? Uh, so it's a desirable stressor. There are also be undesirable stressors, things that we wish were not happening. Death of a loved one, perhaps um, being fired from your job. Obviously many undesirable stressors in the context of death, dying and serious illness, right? Stressors can also vary in terms of controllability. They can either be controllable or uncontrollable. And, you know, the theory kind of breaks them down as a, as a binary, but it's really more useful thing to spectrum. Like how controllable is this or in what ways is this controllable? But just for the sake of simplicity, we'll keep it like this. So they can be controllable or uncontrollable. Uh, this patient is in a room that they're very unhappy in. Well, why are you unhappy in the room? Well, because I, I just have you know, four walls and I, I just, I really want to be able to hear the birds outside. Well, maybe we can move you to a different room. That's a controllable stressor, right? Uncontrollable stressor is, well, I have terminal illness and I cannot stop it, right? So certainly a uh, uncontrollable stressor. Stressors uh, can also be long-term or short-term in nature, right? Sometimes stressors will last for a really long time. Uh, sometimes they're just like, well, I have this one exam that I need to study for, and it's over on Wednesday, and then I never have to worry about it again, right? Uh, or, no, this is going to be a part of my life for the rest of my life. Uh, the uh, duration of the stressor is a really key dimension to understand. And finally, stressors may affect just one life domain. If your goldfish dies and that makes you sad, uh, or several life domains. Well, the death of your spouse is going to make you extremely sad. It's going to affect your finances. It's going to affect your living situation. You may lose relationships. Uh, because of it, uh, it's a, it's a multiplex uh, stressor that affects multiple life domains. So, how do we match different types of social support to different stressor dimensions? According to the theory, in general, controllable, desirable, and short-term stressors, instrumental and informational support are most valuable um, to facilitate problem-focused coping. Right. So these are things that we can control. They may or may not be desirable. It's desirable, certainly information like, yeah, how do I get this desirable thing? Well, here's some information. Here's how you can do it. Uh, but even a, a, a controllable stressor, I want to know how to stop this. I want to know how to fix this. I can do that for you, or I can teach you how to do that, right? Um, Short-term stressors, uh, certainly instrumental and informational support um, are key as well. Teaching the person how to be efficacious in dealing with the actual problem uh, this, these types of stress dimensions are key. For typically uncontrollable, undesirable, and long-lasting stressors, you want to be more in the emotional esteem and network support, right? You kind of think of it as these are the forms of social support that fix, and these are the forms of social support that go alongside, right? Uh, I, that this is a, essentially 
Emotional steam and network support are especially effective for facilitating emotion-focused coping, and the others are more effective for facilitating problem-focused coping. Okay. Regarding grief, um, there was a really interesting article by Jacobson that says, the struggle at first is to manage the feelings provoked by the loss and then to establish a new sense of the world without the presence of the other and or to deal with the material changes which follow the loss. Sorry, that's just a yeah, 10 minute warning, so I don't know. Yeah. Right. Um, so I wanna do a little uh, active learning exercise. Okay, so if everyone could please take um, a note card and pen and just uh, pass it Pass it on down. And here's what we're going to be doing. I want you to take five minutes to write in your note card about a challenging patient case, which, which you've been involved that involves death, dying, or serious illness. Be specific about the details of the case, but do not provide the solutions that you took uh, to address these particular stressors, okay? So write the details of the case, but don't write the solutions, all right? Uh, you're going to be passing this to someone else, so be mindful of patient privacy concerns and all that. Um, then I want you to write whether you think the stressor was desirable or undesirable, controllable or uncontrollable, short-term or long-term, affecting a single life domain or several life domains. There are several stressors. Choose the stressor that was most significant or prominent to you with this particular case. I'll watch the time. Please write for five minutes, okay? And uh, those of you uh, on chat, please, uh, please feel free to do the same. Yes, yes, please. Yeah, please write. Um, yeah, use the optimal matching theory framework to discuss whether you, you know, analyze the stressor, but don't write the solution to the stressor just yet. That'll be for someone you pass the card to. About two minutes remaining. Looks like pencils have mostly stopped, so we'll go ahead and uh, we'll go ahead and move on to the next part of the activity. Wasn't sure quite how many people would be in the specific room, so rather than like, passing cards and partnering up, 
we'll just talk about it as a group, okay? So um, would someone feel comfortable sharing the specific case that they uh, that they wrote about? And then we can, as a, as a group, discuss ways we can strategize using the optimal matching framework, how to create a, an effective and appropriate social support plan for that particular set of circumstances. Would someone feel comfortable sharing? sharing the, uh, the case they wrote about? I would. Yes. Please, thank you. Uh, so this is a patient I saw several years ago, a uh, uh, person in his 50s, very sick, but a lot of comorbid conditions, diabetic, had hypertension, he had neuropathy, he was blind and legally blind, you can see a little bit. Mm -hmm. He had heart failure, he had kidney failure, hyperlipidemia. And he developed a condition called gasking green in mm. one of his lower extremities, which is a lethal condition and not addressed. <laughs> um, and so uh, there was a question about uh, getting his lower limb amputated uh, to potentially save his life. And it wasn't even a guarantee that it would. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. So let's consider, I guess what we'll call that the primary stressor, right? The question of, um, amputation, you know, obviously a very, very severe measure to potentially save his life, but even that's not guaranteed, okay? So let's consider the uh, optimal matching framework. And I'll go back up to, uh, go back up to this here, just it's so we have that. I can't see the chat. Oh, let me click and see what they have to say. Oh, oh, no problem. Thank you very much, Mick. All right. So uh, let's consider the stressor of this uh, stressors of this particular case. How would we classify them in terms of desirability, undesirable. undesirability? Certainly undesirable. Very clear, right? Uh, control. That's kind of an interesting one. This particular case, isn't it? Where would we classify it? And again, we can think of it out of the terms of the spectrum if we if we want. So, un fully uncontrollable here, fully controllable here. What do we think? I'm anticipating today. You want to know what others think? <laughs> well, I, it's my case, so I'm zipping my lip. Yeah. So what others think? Can you both? Potentially. <laughs> might complicate things, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, long term versus short term. I, I want to go back to this because I think if, if your option is mm -hmm. you know, gas converting as an option raised a potential imposition, mm -hmm. the a short term solution to potentially address this mm -hmm. that may make it tolerable mm -hmm. to some degree. Third, with this particular case, lots of COVID is not necessarily um, absolute guarantee of an outcome, but there's an option on the table. Definitely. It can make it more complicated. I think that's a great point. That's a really interesting intersection of the dimensions, right? Of if the short-term solution is effective, then it's certainly more controllable, whereas it's not then otherwise it's it's not. Yes, please. Right. I just want to make the observation that on my perspective, when I got to that question of was controllable, uncontrollable, my sense was the way that I answered that question was going to tell you a lot more about me. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, that's a great point. That's a great point. <laughs> Everything is about perceptions. So that's your communication. What are you communicating? Yes. How big is the frame that you think is in this purview of what's controllable or not controllable? Definitely. It's all controllable. Yeah, right. <laughs> well, so, if, if the controllable part is. It's all problem solving. Right. Yeah. Can we control the, the gas game green? Mm -hmm. If that is a stressor, if we can control the gas game green with the amputation, that is controllable. Yeah. We can also control our emotional data. That's what I'm saying. It's uh, <laughs> going back to the appropriateness piece of it, right? It's probably more about the extent to which the patient perceives yeah. it to be right. any of these things, right? Right. right. Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, so, this is obviously a really common. Thank you very much. It's a great case to discuss because it's very complex. In general, what types of social support, based on what we've learned about optimal matching theory, what types of social support do we think might be most beneficial in terms of categories? And then let's maybe devise a few specific strategies, a few specific actions that we can implement. Well, here I'm going to know Stephanie's observation. While I believe this is controllable, 
we have to start with the uncontrollable, undesirable, long lasting stressors, mm -hmm. the responses first, yeah. in order to make it something that can they're, they're have a solution. Absolutely. Good point. What else? What else are we thinking? So, I mean, we all target. Um, in a, did you say anything in addition to the criminal bullies and the gas as this uh, about the lifestyle? You did say I, diabetic. I did say diabetic. So that's the one. I mean, just I also hyperlipidemia. Okay. So. But I didn't mention anything else on purpose. <laughs> yeah. So there are a lot of um, potentially environmental factors that may make the controllability of this extremely challenging. Absolutely. Absolutely. So what specific, let's, let's, uh, I think we're, we, we, we're, we're, I mean, we're, I'm, where I might be in a place where we actually can implement all five to some capacity, right? <laughs> to the extent that we believe that controlling the gangrene uh, is possible, we're probably very much in instrumental informational support land. But, you know, we're not just uh, we're not just taking an engine out of the car here, as always. Right. Uh, we are also uh, it is important that we address these other things, too. So what things could we do to uh, focus on emotional esteem and network support in this particular patient case? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> great answer. Thank you. <laughs> great answer. All in that. <laughs> at 2 a.m. nonetheless. This was a 2 a.m. cake. Great answer. Yes. He came in at 4 o'clock in the afternoon. Oh, yeah. <laughs> they called me at 2 a.m. And you know what I like about those answers in particular, in addition to agreeing with them? Um, that's a really nice focus on esteem support, because validating person's spiritual beliefs, uh, validating uh, a person's um, ethical standards, right? That's a really powerful form of esteem support. So uh, those are those are great examples. We are just about out of time, uh, and that is all I have for you today. So thank you very much uh, for attending. Thank you for playing along. I appreciate it. Yeah. Happy to answer any questions from uh, from chat or from the live audience. Come on over here. So, so I, I did have a question. Please. So, so you're, 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 I, I remember um, you know, when at my former institution, we had a very robust communications curriculum starting from week one of medical school. And just what are the 12 steps to introducing yourself to a patient? Mm -hmm. um, there are 12 steps, but I can't know how to do that. Um, and so it's not well or heavily adapted in a lot of other health professions education. Mm -hmm. So where do you think this kind of curriculum should exist and at what stage of training. So yeah, yeah. Uh, I, for, I, for, for these for these types of communication skills specifically. For sure. So um, I'm of the opinion that we can always get better at communicating, right? Um, and just begin, everyone thinks that they're a good communicator. It's like, oh yeah, I'm a great listener. Right, uh, so that's a that's a blind spot. And that's actually one of the biggest myths that we as comm scholars try to debunk. Uh, you know, it's like, hey, just because you're hearing someone doesn't mean you're actually listening, right? And uh, just because you think you're doing something, uh, it doesn't mean you're actually doing it, right? Um, so to answer your question in the most advocating for my own discipline kind of way, uh, as much as possible, understanding the extreme constrictions that people in the medical field are under, right? Um, certainly, I think building that into the medical curriculum as early as possible is really, really beneficial to start good habits early, right? But good communication, so there's a, a, one of my favorite uh, models called the Relational Health Communication Competence Model. Uh, and it shows that engaging in those deep, intimate relationships with patients not only is it better for the patients, good for burnout as well, right? Uh, which is, as we know, is rampant in the medical field. Um, so I think it's, it's very beneficial for as, as, as often as possible, um, understanding that there are a lot of uh, restrictive challenges in place for that. Yeah, of course. Particularly for those fields that are really burnt out. Um, I, I think this is a nice, this is a nice solution. Great. Um, other questions from uh, from chat or line? Okay, thank you. Thank you all very much for attending. I appreciate it. It's been a pleasure. <laughs>